Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into the Film God Network on a beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday evening. I guess it's eight o'clock. Yeah. You know, it all merges. Welcome in. We got a great one planned for you guys tonight. Uh, spring games. Spring games were this weekend, so we have plenty of actual football to talk about. But we also have some other storylines and whatnot around the sport to hit on tonight, like this one to start. We have a softening of our sport going on in this world. I had an offensive coordinator, it was like 10 years ago, used to say, the softening of America. Softening of America. You men are just soft. And look, every generation does this. I ain't gonna lie to you. Every generation thinks the next generation a little bit softer. That's right. Even your dad's dads told them that their generation was soft. This happens, right? Um, but not to do this, back in my day, back in my day when I played football, like there were three a days, dude. We had uh, conditioning in the morning and just helmets. Then we had shoulder pad practice. And then at the end of the day, full pad practice. That's what camp was like, right? Spring practice, oh my God. Every day, full pad, full go, tackle to the ground. Like we played football back in my day. And that was like 10 years ago. That wasn't 30 years ago. That wasn't 40 years ago. It was like a decade. It wasn't that long ago. We were playing real football. Fall time, springtime, summertime. Playing real football. Pat it up, thud it up, let's go. Then I turn spring practice games on this weekend. I go look at the tube. And Ohio State's got damn 150 guys standing on the damn sideline. They're in full pads in front of 82,000 people. And they're playing tag. They're literally tagging off in helmets and full pads. And they, I, I thought that was bad. That is bad. That is horrible. You're a full roster. Tackle. Tackle to the ground. Let's go. Save the quarterbacks. I get it. Keep them safe. All that good stuff. But you are a football team this year with Chip Kelly that's probably going to run the ball like 54% of the time. Why are you not hitting each other during a spring game? You're fully healthy. And then I turn on Ole Miss. Ole Miss out here playing seven on seven with the quarterbacks and the fat guys out there running around. And then I turn around and look, oh my God, Joey Chestnut out here with a glizzy competition. Okay. Out here, how, how many hot dogs can y'all hit out here? What? Dunk contest. Great. What are we doing? Softening of America. Softening of football. Welcome in, Rylan Goaty. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. We got a great show tonight. Goaty, what is going on with the sport of football right now? Dude, it's uh it's an ever changing game. We can say it say it that way, that's for sure. It's definitely different than uh I mean even my freshman year. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight years ago, maybe. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. They call me the grandpa. But uh dude, it's definitely it's definitely changing. But from a player that's still in it, uh, you know, I'm accepting some of those changes. I'm 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 liking it in some ways for sure. And it's still certainly a physical game. I mean, you turn it on, on Saturdays and like real Saturdays in the fall, they're still hitting and striking. So it, it's not to be made that much of a deal. Um but I understand it. Like, I just, I couldn't imagine being an old Miss booster right now. And you come out of pocket for a brand new roster. And you're like, hey, let's go check out that brand new roster. And Joey Chestnut's on the big screen eating hot dogs in the middle of your game. Like, yeah, well, I mean, what? I, and you know, Joey Chestnut wasn't free. No, he wasn't. So it's like, I got to pay what for, for who to come here? Joey said, uh, Lane Kiffin slid in his DMs. And it was like, hey, you got Saturday available? Because I'm playing faux football and I need you to eat real dogs. I mean, but that's fire. But I will say, who are we talking about right now? I mean, he's the goat. The goat. Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss football. Oh, am I? Am I, there? <laughs> I thought we were talking about Joey Chestnut. I mean, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm talking about Lane Kiffin. But again, where was he at Ole Miss? Yeah. Everybody's talking about Ole Miss now. That's true. It's, it's got, I mean, any publicity is good publicity. He's that is true. For them. At least it wasn't his Twitter timeline this week. It was his spring game. There was a spring game. But you are right. We are talking about Ole Miss, which. Prior to him was only a bad thing if we were talking about Ole Miss. Just a glorified middle school retreat, you know. That's basically what oh, it, it felt was. like. Got some field tug of day. war, man. It I mean, felt like field day. Field day yeah. was lit back in the I day. I love field day. Field day, a lot of water events. Shock no no water it. events. I feel like you were one of the game. kids that brought cleats on field day. <laughs> uh, you think he's the guy that goes to Top Golf and brings the whole bag? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. God, for sure. Got the glove. Yeah, def definitely don't do that. But. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I honestly think the top golf, not to do a whole conspiracy theory here, I think the top golf clubs are like tweaked to make you hit the ball straighter. I never hit a ball straighter than I do at Top Golf. Never. Come out here, shank apotamus. I'm out there at Top Golf, straight pipe. Just jug a Top Golf. a little more giving them. That's for sure. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think so. If I'm out there trying to impress. I'm gonna use them Top Golf clubs. They, them, uh, rigged. they give you them Bryson DeChambeau 3D printed clubs. Yeah, right no there. doubt, yeah. no doubt about that. Um, but no, it's the same thing. I mean, back to the the spring game competition or discussion. I couldn't imagine invest because that's what we're talking about nowadays. We got we got people investing in these rosters, and then like especially Ohio State, you go out there and you see them tagging off. Like, how, how do you actually evaluate your roster, Gody? When we're not tackling to the ground. I, I just you can kind of see who's covering well and who's blocking well at the line of scrimmage. But outside of that, the plays aren't 100% completed. They're only about 85% completed. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think, again, coming from a guy who's in it right now, there's also 14 other days that the coaches get to eval yeah. that other people don't see. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of people now are just, how can we keep our guys the safest? And that's probably where that's coming from if I had to, if I had to guess. I just thought it was interesting because the whole the whole thing about Ohio State right now is the quarterback discussion. Mm-hmm. Like Will Howard, obviously you brought him in, you presume he's a starter. He throws thirteen passes on the day, but then also like Devin Brown, who we kind of think is a number two, he only throws seven passes, and then you let Sayan and Kineholes finish off the day for you, and they both have three interceptions combined. Did Aaron Nolan get any room? Aaron Nolan went five for seven for forty seven yards and an interception. Okay, are we at the point now where it's just coaches being paranoid, like we can't put anything on film? Like I, I think we've always been there, um, but I, I think now I, I don't. I can't put it on film because you don't also don't want your roster getting poached, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean you, even you put, more you so. put the twos on tape, and everybody's like, "Oh, that guy's a two. He could be a one here." Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. What do, what do you think? Why, why why are these spring games getting so? Uh, I guess basic offensively, at least they were. I mean, it's scattering the reps up there, too. That's the other thing. Yeah. They got a quarterback competition. They gave everybody 11 reps or 11 cuts at is what it sounds like. Sane and Kineholtz at 17 each. That was the highest. Yeah. Nice. I don't know, man. I don't really have an answer for you, but I think it's, again, probably a little bit of everything you said. Probably yeah. a mix of not letting guys see the plays, but also trying to give guys that might want to leave reps so you know you can keep them. I think it's probably a mix of everything. So I, I, I couldn't decide today whether or not I would want my spring game before the portal opened or after. Because if you have your, your spring game before the portal opens, not only do you put that on tape, everyone's seeing that, but also you could have just burnt developmental reps on somebody that's leaving five days from now. Whereas like your Colorado, your, your spring game or your Nebraska, I think it's the 27th. Your spring game is the 27th. You're going to know what your roster is there and you're going to know what it's like. What it looks like then is what it's going to look like in September when you actually got to play a game. So it can resemble a lot more what your roster is going to look like. Whereas Georgia gave Andrew Paul a whole team's worth of reps as the number mm-hmm. one back on the twos unit. And that guy's now in the portal. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I guess the only counter to it would be that if you do have guys that are kind of teetering on the edge and then you give them reps in a spring game where it's a game environment and they feel that kind of like, oh, you know, maybe I, maybe I should stick around. But the game environment for Georgia wasn't that strong on Saturday, so I don't think that would have been a deciding factor. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I, I guess, like, for – Ohio State, you get to show off your prize possession still. Like, you get to show off Jeremiah yeah. Smith. He gets to make his highlight catch, and he gets to get his name out there. But I do agree, like, you bring in Quinshawn Judkins. Like, you want to see that. You want to see the quarterbacks really get after it. And, of course, this defense that you put a lot of money into, bring, I mean, bringing in Caleb Downs. Like, you want to see that. You want to see that on the field. You want to see that physically. So, I mean, it goes both ways. I think there's pros and cons to both for sure. Go, go to, he mentioned the freshman Jeremiah Smith up there at Ohio State. Just how hard is it to play as a true freshman? And and did you see anybody that – for me, it's a physical thing, first and foremost. Like, mm-hmm. you got to be physically prepared. But what are the other things that require to get onto the field like this kid's going to do? I mean, it looks like Jeremiah Smith might be one of the better receivers in the country yeah. this fall. From some of the videos I've seen, he's, yeah. a, he's a dude. Um, I would say – for those skilled positions, it's a little easier to come in and play immediately. I think for guys that have to have strength, you know, O-line, D-line, mm. even linebacker, because linebacker is so hard. I mean, you run in the defense. So, I mean, I think guys on the outside have a little bit of a better chance. But dudes, you know, like George Pickens um, or like this guy at Ohio State, like that are just explosive. Mm-hmm. Like if you just have that big play type of skill set, you're going to find a way on the field. I've always said the receiver – it's a lot easier to get on the field earlier because we can tag you in almost everything. Mm-hmm. Or we can give you your one signaler on the sideline, and we can just make it nice and simple for you. 
Um, whereas like an offensive lineman, you need a thousand reps of a duo combo before you feel good at it, right? Like you're all right. And there's, there's not just a physical, you know, that guy's 330 pounds and he's been lifting for three and a half years in college at the line of scrimmage. It's okay. I got a 200 pound corner and he may be longer than anything I've, I've faced in high school, but the, the strength discrepancies are not that drastic. So that's a, that's a really good point there. Um, all right. Welcome to tonight's show. Like I said, we got a load of them for you. We're going to talk about our biggest takeaways from Alabama spring game out there in Tuscaloosa. Um, Ohio State spring game set the standard not for physicality, but for attendance. I mean, my Lord, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Florida's still out here being Florida. Can't believe it. Could not. I mean, unfathomable. Uh, Big word there for the big guy. Um, What is the portal actually looking like right now? Uh, We are about four hours from the official opening. But if you're trying to get in first, you've already sent Hayes Fawcett a DM. So there are some activity. There is some activity rather going on in the the transfer portal right now. We'll talk a little bit about that and update that further. Um, And shout out to Prize Picks, our premier sponsor here tonight. I think they're up here, right? Yep, you got it. Shout out to Prize Picks. Okay, prizepicks.com, promo code Brooks. Get 100% deposit match. What does that mean? Put up to $100, you get $100 instantly right there in your account. I want to give a quick shout out because I didn't to start the show and introduce this gentleman here to my left. He is Rylan Gody. okay? He spent, what, a half decade at Georgia? Felt like it, yeah. Felt like a half decade (laughs) at Georgia, uh, got a couple national championship rings, um, then spent a year at Mississippi State, is now at Georgia Tech. So uh, thank you, my man, for coming out here, man. Appreciate you, bro. Thanks for having me. First time in the studio. What do you think? Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Speechless. I walked in and I was like, "Dagum, I need to get me one of these. This is awesome, man." Yeah, it's a uh, it's an internet content creator's dream. Oh, that's dude, for absolutely. sure. Absolutely, you can do endless things in here. That's for sure. Yeah, that, that was the whole point. The whole point when I designed it was like, "Hey, I got ADD, like real bad, <laughs> like real, real bad." And I kind of like to let my ADD go wherever it wants to go during the content creation. If I want to get up and show something, I can get up and show something. In my other studio, which was a garage. It was not like that, right? It was one camera here, one camera here. Your boy was sitting here switchy switching, and we were just doing the takes. Now I have all the ability to go wherever I want. Endless possibilities. Endless man. possibilities. I will say the uh, the wall is my favorite. Yeah, I love it. This wall or that wall? This wall right here. Behind this wall you. right here. Pictures, you know, the names. Mr. Krabs doesn't do get a better. lot of love. I do like here. Mr. Krabs. But they don't get to see him. I, I think he's one of my best additions in the studio. You know what that is? That is the famous picture of Notorious B.I.G. doing a money spread, but it's Mr. Krabs instead of Biggie. I like it. So, yeah, we got that going on. No, appreciate the love. Appreciate you coming out here, man. Uh, we finally topped off our home and home. You know, I came out there and did a, 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 right. a, a player's pod and, and then came out here, and, and now, you, now you're hitting it with us. So, Two we'll years later, off. I had to. I had to get you back. Yeah, yeah. that's on me. No, that's that, on, that me. on me. Or is that's that on, on you? Me. I that's took, on you. I took two years to get to you. That's, that's my fault. You. That's my fault. Big league me for two years. That's okay. Aaron Murray's been ducking me for about six months now. So it, 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 it must run in the, the Georgia blood. <laughs> <laughs> easy, um, easy. Dang, man, come on. I mean, he, he he might stop ducking me one of these days, but I think this was more of a scheduling issue, no doubt. Not an unwillingness to states. do so. Yeah, whole thing going on. Got to play a, a season and all that shit. Um, <laughs> with Murray, with Murray, it's just him ducking. I think I think Murray's incentive to <laughs> to do what you want him to do is much less. Like he's been on the show plenty of times. Correct. But like him going out and facing a, a former center at a D two school to play a quarterback competition. Like, why would you do that? A lot more on the line there. Yeah, Yeah, you have a lot to lose there. Yeah, a lot to lose. Uh, Make sure you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe and all that good stuff. All right, Um, Alabama. They call it A-Day out there, I think is what they call it. Alabama had A-Day this past weekend. Um, Kalen DeBoer's first debut, if you will, uh, in the SEC and in this conference, in this this region, I should say. Um, My first takeaway was, my God, the grass. It didn't exist. Mm, Sand pit. Yeah, straight up sand pit. Disgusting. Now, some teams get around this with a good old can of spray paint. Yeah. Georgia invested. Georgia, Georgia notorious spray painters. Not to give away the secret. Like the Augusta National 
light yeah. version out there, man. It was insane. Shawty was green, green. So were my <laughs> shoes when I left. <laughs> so, yeah, invest in some spray paint, and you won't be out here on social media getting absolutely cooked like Alabama was. But apparently, it was a reside in the process ah. going on. So, mm. it's supposed to look nice and luscious and green come September. I'm sure it so will. That's all that matters. I'm sure it will. Um, the other thing was noticeable attendance. They had 72,000 people there Saturday, boys. It's not bad. Not bad at all. I mean, but it is Kalen DeBoer's first instance coaching. Like, if there's something exciting, I've learned this about spring games. If there's something exciting, there's been a big change, it's usually you bring a big attendance. Like, like when Kirby Smart came, they did 93K a day, and they filled it out, and they had Luda do half or pregame concert and stuff like that. Like, it's a big deal in a transition. Now, if they do this next year with Kalen DeBoer, that would be impressive. But this year, it's kind of like, yeah, you expect that. I think it's a good enough crowd, too, for a first year for Kalen DeBoer. Because, like, if you want to compare it to Georgia, like, Georgia had everything going for them in Kirby Smart's first year for a spring game. Like, you brought in the five-star Jacob Eason. You had Kirby Smart. Yeah. Like, you had all the lore around your spring game for everybody to, to that sucker. I mean, they even had Ludacris as a pregame celebrity and all this stuff, rapping and what whatnot. So, I mean, it's certainly drawing in attendance, doing all the right things. So, that's a good start. And let's be honest. Kirby pushed it hard. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, very made very evident that this was going to be a standard setting moment for for what the program was going to look like what attention to football was going to be in this area all that good stuff i didn't hear the the propagandizing coming from DeBoer, so this no. was a casual 72k showing yeah. up to watch this football program uh were you what, what was going on with you in 2016 during g day i was there you were there yeah i was there uh just got my driver's license shout out feels like about you know 20 years ago but uh dude yeah i was there it was uh it was it was bumping for a spring game, ninety three thousand. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Insane. I think it showed up at fifty five k this year, uh, but two years in a row closing half of the stadium yeah. down. So we I gotta, if you don't mind, I gotta give a shout out to the the Tech spring game real quick. Yeah, man, go Dude, for it. Was, it. Uh, we had a good little crowd. It was it was packed and. Uh, the boys look good, dude. It's a it's a big time for Georgia Tech football. Dude, I have, I have a, a sister that just graduated from there, um, and obviously Georgia played there this year, yep. right? Um, that is an elite student section, bro. It's, that student section gets down. I wasn't familiar with it until now that I've been there. But dude, the tradition that's around that program and Coach Key, it's it's second to none. It's been awesome so far. That's dope. And they drive the 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 old school mobile yeah. out every time. Yeah, dude. No, got, I got to run out behind that in the spring game. It was it was pretty cool. The Ramblin wreck. Yeah. So yeah, to talk to us, man, just about the spring game in general. What, what, how how'd it go down? How y'all looking? Dude, we're looking good. It was actually my first spring game I've ever played in in six years. <laughs> believe it or not, bro. That's Be- wild. Believe it or not. Well, well, hold on, we got to get some backstory. A lot of okay. baseball and a couple injuries. Freshman year baseball. Yeah. COVID. Okay, so early enrollee year baseball. Uh, uh-huh. COVID. Um. Third year was shoulder surgery. Mm-hmm. Fourth year was uh, MCL, mm-hmm. and then last year I wasn't with the team. So yeah, and then this year was it was awesome, dude. Big cleanup operation time during the spring yeah. at a lot of you know big time programs. Mm-hmm. You know you got a little niche or a little twinge. Let's go ahead and get that cleaned up. You know, mm-hmm. I mean? let's no go ahead and get in there, get that done. But not nah, um, big year for Tech. I mean, coming off of mm-hmm. a, a really good offensive year last year, I believe you replaced a coordinator on the defensive side of the football. Yes, correct? sir. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, it's a year three, year two for two. Key. Two and a half. Two and a half because he finished yep. out uh, after Collins. And then, uh, very rare you see that where the interim gets to end mm-hmm. up keeping the job. Um, I would imagine him playing there had a big role to do with that. Or played a big role in that. What? What? I mean, it's the second coach now that you've played for that played at that university. Yeah. How how big of a of a role does that play at Tech more so than even Georgia, where at Tech, man, like. You really are a student first, and you're an athlete yeah. second. Like it's a different vibe over there at Tech, I would imagine. Dude, it's been really, really cool uh, to be a part of. You know, I grew up 30 minutes from downtown Atlanta, and so yeah. um, always known about Tech. But having Coach Key, you know, just like Coach Smart, but having Coach Key be a part of that university, there's so much buy-in from everybody on the team because we can trust that he knows what it's about. Yeah, and you can trust every word that comes out of his mouth. That's what's been really cool about him is he's been so personable. Like we'll have team meetings and he's just in there cracking it up with us. Like mm. he 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 turns it on when he needs to, but also he's so relatable that it makes it so easy to play for him and trust him because he's been in our seats before. Former O line guy, right? Yeah, yeah, big O line like, guy. I remember hearing about him just like from 
Georgia always observing his evaluations from afar. Mm -hmm. Basically, they wouldn't say it this way, but it almost came across to other coaches where if Brent offered a kid, we'd better go check that guy out because that he is he knows something about this position. Mm -hmm. Can you feel that in just the way he coaches? I mean, you're obviously an extension of the offensive line as a tight end. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, his knowledge of the game is unbelievable, and I would say even even beyond that, his knowledge of of relationships and the way he knows people. So obviously he was at Alabama for a little bit and mm-hmm. he was there when they were recruiting me. And so I'd, I'd had a conversation with him, but didn't really remember it very well. Um, and the first time I talked to him before I committed to tech, I was like, Hey, good to meet you. And he's like, good to meet you. I've known you for seven years. And I was like, it's <laughs> crazy. He, he's able, he's done that with hundreds of thousands of kids yeah. and he's able to remember that, which is something that I think is, is one of his strong suits is just being good at relationships. Tremendous recalls, what that sounds yeah, like as dude, well. No doubt, no doubt. I have found that that is a key in almost all successful people. I have a tr- I have a tough time with memory, so it's a tough one for me. But with in terms of re- in terms of recall and relationships, like even something as simple as remembering your name, like no remembering your name in a conversation will carry an impression with that with that person a really really long time. Um, all right, shout out to the Georgia Tech folks. Let's continue to talk about this a day game. Um, Quarterback, okay? Quarterback, mm-hmm. obviously well talked about at that university. They got four good ones, okay? Four really good ones. Um, most notably, Jalen Milrow, right? Um, I think overreactions are hysterical, me personally. Mm-hmm. I tend to do it as well. I really do. In one, in one of my notes in spring ball, I wrote down, C.J. Allen, this is what him getting beat looks like. This is how good he's playing right now. And then the next play gets driven like nine yards and put on his head. And I'm like, okay, easy this game will humble you really quickly so overreactions tend to happen especially during the spring when we've been you know in a football withdrawal for like four months it feels like right so you tend to have these so when you see Jalen Milrow throw a dover a deep over and it's a dot 65 yard touchdown 59 yard touchdown let's be easy on running to Twitter and calling him the next Jaden Daniels Shout out J.D. Piquel. Let's be nice and easy when we do this, okay? Because not only does he have a whole season to play, but there was a remainder of that spring game to be played, right? Especially for him. He did not complete another pass the rest of the day, okay? 0 for 7 the remainder of the day. 0 for 6 the remainder of the day. So when we see a nice little Dover route, ooh, hey, ooh, good design. Love the clear out. Love the Dover from DeBoer. Ran the same exact play during uh, the game against... It was a quarterfinal game. Washington, Texas. Right, same play against Texas. Okay. Great design. Awesome play. Terrific ball. Let's be easy on this guy might win the damn Heisman after seeing one ball. Okay. That's all I got on that one. Easy on the overreactions. Let's be careful. Okay. Because it was 0 for 6 after that, which has been this guy's MO, by the way. It has been boomer bust for Jalen Milrow. Mm-hmm. I, it, it's a great offense to be in boomer bust in because he's going to design a bunch of those. I promise you that based on watching it at, at Washington. But classic overreaction that we typically see. And it wasn't just our guy, JD. It was, it was the whole timeline. I mean, I think it's important to remember, too, that he's working with basically an entire new group of wide receivers. He doesn't bring back a whole lot of rapport there for himself, so mm-hmm. he's kind of working with new guys to really good freshmen that I'm sure that will continue to build. Look at you caping for a Bama Q. Well, I'm just playing I'm a little bit kidding. devil's advocate. You said no overreactions. I'm, I'm giving kidding. some legitimate analysis, doing my job, and you're going to crap on me. But, <laughs> you know, like Caleb Odom and Ryan Williams, I think those guys could probably – and continue to develop and maybe into his top targets as the season goes on. But yeah, yeah Ryan, mean, Ryan will get there this summer, but Caleb's there. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, just not a whole lot to work with right there and still, you know, building up those relationships with those guys too. But yeah, not a great day statistically. Spring is what overreactions are for, dude. Like if you're not <laughs> scrolling through your timeline, seeing one play where it's like, he's the next, he's the next Heisen winner. It's like, or they got one. He and they're doing the same thing with DJ Lagway when he threw one post over the middle. By the way, JD gets the silver medalist for this. Gold medalist goes to, I believe, either, I think it's Mike Bratton, SEC Mike. Oh. I saw SEC Mike tweet out that he was checking Arkansas's Heisman, or quarterback's Heisman odds. The transfer from Boise State. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. That's a take. That is a take right there. By the way, they don't have the odds for him. He's the Arkansas quarterback. He's going four and eight. Um, <laughs> you can't, hard to win the Heisman. Hard to win the Heisman. Uh, but anyways. The t- the, you're right. Overreactions have them. Again, I compared C.J. Allen. Didn't compare him. 
I said, haven't seen Roquan play. Didn't see Roquan play. This is the best linebacker I've seen at Georgia. That, that's my opinion of CJ so far through 14 months of his career. Yeah. Um, 14 months in like six games, seven yeah. games. We'll ask you to go too far. Is that a hot take? No, he's really good. Yeah. Well, that's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> he's really good. Um, back to the A day. We keep coming off of this. You mentioned the wide receiver corpse. Uh, the corpse. It is corpse. It's spelled corpse. C O R P S, but yeah. pronounced core. Yeah, but it's not pronounced. Tomato, tomato. All right. It's keep, not a literal corpse. You are correct. That's what it, um, but it's funny. It that looks you said, like one. It's though. funny that you said corpse. It's, it's barren. That's what I'm going to say. Look, you, you talked about Caleb Odom had a good spring. Don't know what the, the, the performance looked like. Two receptions, 11 yards. Yeah, was dunking on folks in previous scrimmages, so I was told. Like, going to be a problem type of evaluation coming out of Caleb Odom. Was a kid out of Carrollton here that I projected as a tight end because just of his body. But then that's what you look at. And then you talk to him and you're like, oh, you've been playing football for like 36 months. You're a power forward. That's what you are. You're straight off of the basketball court because someone told you Julian Lewis was in town. Boom, SEC wide receiver. That's what he has turned into. Um, He's going to be a guy for them moving forward very, very quickly is what it sounds like. Outside of that, it's it's really really empty at this point, as you would imagine from you know both portal exits and you know previous misses. Mm-hmm. They had a bunch of years there mm-hmm. where we went through it. Every we did the five star films or five star study on the wide receiver position. They got a bunch of misses over the last like three or four years out there. Yeah, I mean Javon Baker ended up transferring out. Ajayi is how you pronounce Ajayi Hall. He was yeah. one that also dipped out on them. And then you lose one of your best weapons in Isaiah Bond from last year to Texas. It's just been a tough go at them for a program that has dominated at recruiting that position for the last few years up until now and now it's kind of been a turnstile a little bit over there yeah it's weird to think about just because i mean you think five years ago they had arguably the best wide receiver core ever and now it's it's a barren wasteland i mean it's just weird to look at how different five years ago alabama was as a whole i mean from where they are now but that's how quickly the sport of college football is moving nowadays still would take it i would imagine Still, still filled with some real, real. Talent. Oh, for sure, yeah. for Just sure. Nothing proven yet. But you don't have Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs no. and all the guys that you had when you did have them. The real problem when you look at their depth chart right now is their defensive back room. They've had to move Malachi Moore back to safety. Mm-hmm. Um, they lost Trey Battle Jr. to the transfer portal this off season. Um, but obviously, you lose two first round corners, and you're like, ooh. We're going to struggle here, right? Uh, yeah, they got a red shirt freshman on one side and Khalil. I got it written down somewhere in here. Um, Khalil Hurley, I believe is his name. Um, and then Damani Jackson, the transfer from USC, is slotted to be the other starter. After that, it's three true freshmen to kind of round out the depth chart at corner. Playing freshman at corner is sustainable in the sense if they're great and talented, right? But that's that's a big jump. To go from guys who aren't quite proven. Damani's not even quite proven yet. He got yeah. playing time out of USC, but it wasn't great. Uh, just thoughts on, on the corner of that room there, Ryan? I think it's hard, especially on the, the back end of the defense, to be able to, to come in as a young guy and understand the switches and the pass-offs and motions and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, you know, at a, at a big school like Alabama, those guys are going to be up to the task. No yeah, doubt. I mean, it's five-star Jalen Mbakwe. Uh, it's it's five star insert freshman here and four star insert freshman here. So talent, just figure out how to play and play quick. Yeah, it feels like Alabama might be on the same track of what they were last year. Where like you might it might be a little rough at the beginning of the season. There might be some bumps in the road, but then like once you hit like week six, week seven, from that point on, it might look like a much better Alabama team because it's it just seems like a team that needs more reps. Like Jalen Monroe needs more reps with his wide receivers. The running back room needs more touches. The defensive the defensive backs they need more in game reps as well. So I think this is might be a second half college football team this year. And the chat points out a good point. They, they not only you know they brought in Keon Saab through the transfer portal out of Michigan, and that was a guy who, as the season progressed last year, as a young football player on an NFL like looking defense, right? He got more and more and more and more playing time to the point where in in the playoffs, like he was a key contributor for a, a really 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 good defense um, there. So you would imagine they're going to be active or trying to be active right now in a less than active portal. Mm. Not a super active portal right now. No, it is not. We can talk about that here in just a little bit. The other thing coming out of A-Day that was very, very obvious, or at least 
out of spring practice at Alabama. They have four, like, scholarship quarterbacks. You're probably not going to keep all of them, you would imagine. And there looks to be an odd man out. Let's just talk about it from an obvious standpoint. Milrow is the presumed starter. Ty Simpson out there is the presumed backup, who by all accounts, from everything I've heard, sounds like he's a power force, like ready to start kind of guy. Um, So that would tell me that Jalen Milrow is not going to be allowed to struggle this year. Like, not bad. I'm not saying he will, okay? But if he does... I, I would imagine very short leash. Okay. So after that, um, you're looking at the Austin Mack kid who they brought with them from Washington, who they also asked to reclass at Washington. DeBoer liked him so much. And then there's Dylan Lonergan, who again appears to be the odd man out. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen there, but it seems like there's a pecking order out there at Tuscaloosa. Hmm. Yeah, and it's hard to keep that many guys on a roster nowadays just because – That many good ones. Well, when you stack so much talent like that, it's obvious. And in poaching, like we've seen, is pretty much legal at this point. So you can have guys come in and say, hey, you're the four string. We'll give you an extra pay raise, and you'll be the starter over here. So it's going to be very hard for them to hold on to all four, I think. I think the board did the right thing in making sure that at least throughout the spring, you got to look at all of your options and kind of weigh it out and see which guys that you really like and really finalize your pecking order before you got into fall camp and before you got into the fall and just establish your depth chart. And so then you can figure out who your odd man out is. And then you got to live with that decision of knowing Dylan Lonergan, if he is the odd man out in this scenario, wherever he goes, we live with that decision of if he's great, then we just missed out on that one and maybe we make the wrong decision. Go to you spent the last three, like your, particularly your last three seasons, right? In this time of the year, the portal has been active mm-hmm. and you've been at three different programs and you've been active in the portal yourself. Um, how honest are programs nowadays with like where kids stand? Is it just blatant like here it is or is there some finagling going on on some rosters where you know coach trying to make you feel like he like you but in reality he don't you don't have to like be specific yeah but i mean you talk to a bunch of players you've been in other white programs that have other players from other programs are programs being honest with kids nowadays because they have to be or is there still some finagling going on to keep their rosters tight that's a great question i think there's a huge difference between transfer portal recruiting and high school recruiting yeah because there's three years or four years however long it is in high school they can kind of flirt with you a little bit Mm. and you know tease you and lie to you a little bit more but i think when you're in the portal it's it's a quick like hey we need this okay we need you now yes or no yeah and so if it's a no you're gonna move on to the next guy i think that it's a pretty straightforward approach when you're coming from the portal at least that's what i've experienced now I have experienced in one of my recruiting cycles where I found out later they were completely lying to me. Mm. Um, but most of the time, it's 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 pretty straightforward. Now, like from a depth chart standpoint, I don't even have to see it in black and white on a board. I can feel it in practice as a player, correct? I'm either getting reps or I'm not. Yeah, and I think that's, that's one of the things that a lot of the, you know, programs nowadays do a good job of is just being honest with where you're at, at least mm. what I've experienced. Um, and be like, hey, this is what you need to improve on to get to this, or hey, you're already here, let's do this to get you here. Mm. Um, I think it's been, at least you know, where I've been, been a great experience of, of truth and honesty. So, I mean, you would have to imagine that's the way you have to be as a coach because you hope and pray you're getting that from the other side. Because mm-hmm. nowadays it's two-way bargain. No doubt. And I used think, to be, it wasn't. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what's cool about you know, playing for Coach Key now and you know, Coach Smart. The guys that have, have really played the game – understand how it works and they have an appreciation for honesty as well and so that they, they can put themselves in your shoes and be like i would have liked this and so mm. for those guys it's it's been nice playing for them because they respect that aspect yeah be, being the i mean you are literally a player's coach you know you're a guy who did it and been there i always hated when like i play for a guy that would ask me to do something that he didn't know was impossible to do because he just hadn't done it you know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, you're a right tackle. Go scoop that three who keeps slanting away from your face. <laughs> and you're like, hey, buddy, shit ain't happening. Like, it's just not happening today. Okay? It's not happening today. It didn't happen when you didn't play. Quit asking me to do it. Um, always hated that. Just got to be an athlete. Now. Yeah, just be better. Just like, got to be an athlete. Coach, coach, come on. Try. It ain't happening. <laughs> do, as, do as I say, not as I did. Yeah. Ugh. Just ugh, bug the shit out of me. Um, th- very rarely nowadays do you run into a guy at Power Five football that's coaching you who didn't literally did not play. Um, but you know, one of the greatest to do it right now is Todd Hartley. You played for him. he didn't mm-hmm. play, did he? Played high school ball. Played high school ball, yeah. but like not one of these guys that played at a super high level. No, he didn't. But 
He's awesome, man. Boy, you got to be yeah. a dude to climb the ranks with that backpack. Yeah. Like that backpack. He's putting his yeah. dues, man. He's oh, shit. I, you know, I owe a lot to you know Coach Key first of all with where I'm at right now, and Coach Buster, um, but also you know Coach Smart and Coach Hartley um, for those couple years that I was there. And he's Hartley's Hartley's awesome. Yeah, I got a picture of him from Saturday, where it's uh, Ethan Barbour, the 2025 commit they got out of Alpharetta, mm-hmm. who's now going to play at Milton this fall. It's going to be fun to watch. Um, then they got Elias Williams, the six foot seven. Have yeah. you heard the numbers on this kid? No. Goatee, he's he's a walk, he's a, a rising senior. He is six foot seven and a half. He's got ten and a half inch hands. He's two hundred forty three pounds. Jeez. And that's, how long was wingspan? You said? Oh, yeah, eighty five inches. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's it. Yeah. I think mine's eighty one. It's pretty long. Eighty five. <laughs> eighty five is long. Eighty five. Eighty five is goofy. Eighty five is what Mary Smith ma- measured in oh, at the combine. Jeez. He's a freak. Yeah. Entire shoes he's, not bend over. Straight goofball. So man. the picture is uh, hardly like pushing and juicing up Elias and Ethan's in the background with his hand around uh Ikan Baron. Ica Baron. Ica Baron. Yeah. Don't look at me like I know how to pronounce. The Ikanagbon. Ikanagbon. There you go. The Nigerian edge rusher that just committed out of New Jersey. Uh I have a scouting theory. Do you want to hear it? Absolutely. Uh you've played with a lot of Nigerian bloodline individuals. A lot of them. I don't know if you know this. A lot of them. Uh, every Nigerian athlete I've ever covered is the most twitchy, explosive, like muscle bound dude ever. And they cannot keep, you cannot keep weight off them. Really? Bro, they can look at a, a 45 pound weight and put on muscle. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. So think about guys that you've played with. These would, this would be like Aziz Ojolari. Mm-hmm. Um, this would be, they got a, a kid this year, this class, Jonah, Jonah Ajongbe. Joseph Jonah Ajonye. Wow. There, there you go. Butchered. Um, Sam and Pimba is Nigerian as well. Um, yeah, and then the 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 class the class is moving forward, all green and white flags. Bro, talk about Aziz just brought me back to this, but playing them in high school when it was Aziz, BJ, mm-hmm. Reed Gilbert, Harrison mm-hmm. Bailey, mm-hmm. bro, those dudes were different. Man. Had a, Aziz uh, and BJ, Marietta had a tight end too, or a wide receiver that uh, like the Ramel second Keaton. wide receiver, Ramel Keaton, yeah, up at Tennessee, Ramel Keaton. Man, they they were uh, that was the two. <laughs> crazy man crazy it, it it was a scouting lesson about harrison bailey about hey he looks really good but how could you not <laughs> you know what i mean like one dudes, of those things dudes all around yeah dudes everywhere um speaking of dudes everywhere florida <laughs> The state of Florida. Not enough dudes everywhere. Yeah. State of Florida. Dudes not Trump. everywhere. Dudes. <laughs> That's hilarious. State of Florida. Dudes. Okay. Florida football program right now. What what was it? What was the direct quote from uh Steve Spurrier? There's a lot of confusion. Uh, Is that what it was? Very disorganized. Disorganized. Was. Hard to understand what's going on down here. Don't love it. Okay, one thing we've been talking about on this program is the special teams, and we don't do a lot of special teams talk, okay? It is definitely the third of three phases, okay? But when you're out here running nine guys out on a field goal block team, you look kind of goofy, especially when you're doing it in critical situations and games that, you know, you lost. Doesn't look good. When you run 10 guys out on the punt unit, get flagged for it, okay? Have to take another down. When you're doing these kind of like, wow, how did we be how are we so disorganized that we allowed this to happen type stuff just little things like yeah offense looked great put up 470 today but gave up a punt return when you had 10 guys on the field doesn't look good right these types of things happen over and over again and the what the one area we've kind of pointed to was it's really hard to be a a young football coach right young head coach at a power five first time head coach but it's also really hard to be your own coordinator. Like the greatest coaches in this sport are not coordinators. They hand it over. They give it to somebody. They hire it out, right? They outsource one of the really, really hard things to do, which is day-to-day operations of putting together a game plan that will go out and execute and win on Saturday. And then maintaining that game plan on Saturday when things are constantly changing. So yeah, If you're trying to be a first-time head coach, you might burn timeouts and not have them right before the half because you mismanaged timeouts because you mismanaged the situation earlier because you were too worried about our second down package next time when we don't get yardage on first down, right? What does our 2-12 and package look like? Shit, coach, we just ran nine guys out on punt. That's happening over and over again. We keep talking about it. 
How do you allow this to happen? Because you are not allowing coordinating uh, responsibilities to be outsourced. You're too hands-on in that situation. The only coach right now in college football who is calling their own plays and doing so and winning at a high rate is Steve Sarkeesian. And he's got one. He's got one season like this. But he's also got a season where he's got five one-score losses. I would imagine those five score one score losses, there was some mismanagement somewhere in there. I guarantee it. All right, so these things cost football games. And guys, the only thing Billy Napier's got to do this year, the only thing to possibly save his job is to not be embarrassing. If they are highly competitive, if they are not a joke, if people don't laugh, you can lose by three points, buddy, I promise you. But if you are getting beat by 20 and you are running 10 guys out on a field goal block unit, people are going to laugh. Twitter's going to laugh. Your fan base says they're going to be happy. And you're going to be gone. You can't run 10 guys out twice on a spring game. You can't do that. Y'all go ahead. Well, I think the most important thing that fans at least want to see from a head coach, especially now that you're going into year three, is they at least want to see improvement of things that maybe weren't working in the past and keep seeing, again, like just development of the overall team and more success in building upon that. And lately, at least make, the, make it look like there's light at the end of the tunnel. Whereas it feels like you're going away from the light at Florida. It seems like you're just stuck in the same spot and you're not going anywhere. And especially doing this in a spring game, like a, a controlled situation, it just doesn't make sense. Dude, he, he, he promoted one of his position coaches to assistant head coach and and gave him what looks to be coordinating titles but did not give him a coordinating title he did the same thing with rob sale last offseason okay and every time he's asked about it he was just asked about it last week he did the hee ha hum ha coach speak punting the conversation i'm not going to answer it it's he basically responded with yeah we, we've done some promotion in house we've done this that and this that and this that but we played good offense last year that's not the point bro the the, the point is not that you play good offense or bad offense the point is you look discombobulated and you can't be discombobulated and win football games that's the point so yeah he did it again he he was i mean i can't i can't imagine being a florida fan couldn't and I, my question to you, I know I'm putting you in a tough spot, Goody, because you're an active player. My question to you is, you sit in special teams meetings. You have, you have had to sit in special teams meetings. I sit in special teams meetings. If you are not accountable on Saturdays, it's because you were dicking off in the meeting on Friday. You're talking about as far as a player? As a player, yes. You yeah, don't even think, have to criticize a coach. Criticize no, a player. Yeah, that's where All you're doing is not knowing you were the two on special teams block when the damn guy went down. That's it, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think it's definitely – it's hard to tell if it's, a, if it's a player thing or what's going on no matter where it is. But, I mean, I think as a player, your, your responsibility is to, to be locked in. And, you know, it, ha- everybody, it happens to everybody. Like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen from time to time. No, you know, no matter who you are, you're going to have lapses sometimes. But it's just, you know, you got to correct them and – and move on it's the repetitive issues that made me point to leadership that's all yeah as an analyst that's all that's all i can say yeah repetitive I mean, issues are our coaches when it's, it's 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 almost a joke at that point because when you consistently do one thing that can be fixed just by coaching like obviously players are going to be players and they're going to make mistakes but when it's a repeated mistake in the same area that's a huge issue to where the fact that you have to start looking at the higher ups as to why is this happening hmm I saw people posting highlights, too, of the running backs, which the running backs look great. I think Florida has done a great job of recruiting running backs, and they get good guys in that Took room. Took a take from Georgia, train on with. But, but the only thing that I noticed in those clips was the defensive line getting pushed off the ball three <laughs> yards down the field, linebackers missing tackles still. like Again, it's the same thing, same issues that they've had at Florida. I just don't see any improvement. Man, Austin Armstrong going to end up on Georgia's staff so goddamn quick. <laughs> so goddamn quick. they going to get a dude, too. Oh, man, I think he's such a great young coach. And I think both of them are great young coaches. They're just just little things. And it's yeah. like the more and more I watch great programs, it really is little things. Like, it, it, I mean, you can speak to this. It is little things. It is daily making sure that you're not messing up the little shit in this, in this sport. It's the details, man. That's, yeah. where the, that's where the margin of error is, is in the details. Absolutely. And DJ Lagway looked great. Yeah. DJ Lagway did everything that everyone knew DJ Lagway was going to do. I just hope I, I hope for him he gets to see DJ Lagway play football because um, it just, I don't know, got to go seven and six, right? Is that what we said last time talking yeah. about it? Yeah. Got to go seven and six to keep your job there. So uh, we'll see. Even though I, I don't, I, I'm not great at gauging other fan bases' temperature. Seems pretty hot down there. Mm hmm. Doesn't seem all all that too ho hum. Uh, Eighty two thousand people 
at the shoe is insane for a spring game watching folks play tag. That's a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people. Um, what does that say? I mean, it speaks a lot why why their rosters is as expensive as it is. Well, it makes it has me leading to a few questions. First, did the players know or did fans <laughs> know that this was going to be two hand touch? Because if you got out there and like, wait, why aren't they tackling? I would have been pissed if a fan. Yeah, like there, because I mean, there, was there any rule announcements like, hey, this is just going to be we're doing thud up, not even thud, but just we're just going to be touching off on this. And if eighty thousand people still came for that, that's impressive. But otherwise, I feel like Ryan Day might have kind of duped the fans there. I th- I, well, if he ain't duping the fans up there, they're, they're, those fans get more access to that football program than any top notch football program I've ever seen. Someone in the chat saying they charge fifty bucks a person too. What? That's what someone in the chat just said. They said it was 50 bucks a person. Holy shit. Is that straight NIO cash? It's going somewhere. It's funding something. Boy, you know what? Bro, imagine paying $50 to watch a two-hand touch match. Bro, their AD is in his bag right now. 82,000 people, $50 a head. What's that running up? I got you. Just give me that. 82K times 50 uh, for a two-hand touch game. But Caleb Downs was out there. Jeremiah Smith was out there. Hey, Will Howard look good. That's about four point one million. Jeez, holy cow! Four point two, yeah. Holy cow! Did you do that in your head? Yeah. Good God. Yeah. Next time, say that on air. I I don't want to. Yeah. Jeez, bro. I've been in school for this long, and you start to learn some things. (laughs) Yeah. I'll never learn how to do math like that in my head. Not like that. I'll be in school for nine years. I'll still never learn that shit. I mean, he just did base numbers and then. I mean, yeah, I did zeros. zeros, Yeah, he did eight times five carries zeros. I would have gotten there. I was thinking other jokes. I was trying to make jokes. Um, But yeah, what what are your jokes? I didn't get there either. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, eighty-two for some tag is wild. So uh, that's insane. But you know, their roster value has to be over twenty million dollars at this point. Yeah. Has if he was if he was cited for thirteen million in twenty twenty two, their roster looks way better. And they were the, the other thing about that is they retained first rounders. J two two was a first round mm-hmm. eval this this well, draft. Well, you know, in that article that I was talking about the um, dinner for the Colorado Buffaloes, they mentioned in the bottom of the article that they estimated that it's probably double the price of what a roster costs like two years ago. Like their price is doubled almost twenty six. Yeah, it's insane, bro. That's that's over two million dollars a month they got to come up with in cash, liquid, and they just covered two months of it with that. Bro, that's wild ass payroll. I, the donor fatigue's got to be insane everywhere, everywhere. Unless you got a billionaire sitting around, donor fatigue's got to be absolutely. I know nuts. you show keep enough. up, huh? How do you think it's going to adjust? Do you think this can keep up at this rate? No, I think. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how well versed you are in the the house versus NCAA lawsuit. I'm not. I don't okay, really so pay that lawsuit is surrounded by, or the face of that lawsuit is a swimmer out of Arizona State. He's going to be on the Olympic team soon. But they chose him because they knew he had time to go fight the, the lawsuits and would do it. So he's got to go sit in court every almost every single time. So he's, he's the face of this lawsuit. This lawsuit is basically going to cripple the NCAA structure. It's, it's really hard to explain in like a 10-minute segment. But um, basically what's going to happen is college programs are going to have to pay reparations. Hmm. Uh, the SMS, AS, estimations are like $10 million per school like per conference across the power five. And instead of they're, they're going to concede that and then basically blow it up and make a super league. Wow. <clears throat> Either a super league or there will be some type, some type of concessions in this house versus incident lawsuit that set precedent for what the new incident structure looks like that will essentially separate revenue sports from non-revenue sports. Hmm. That's the ideal situation. Where the NCAA is saved, it can stay intact to control softball, baseball, basketball, all the non-revenue sports. Basketball will be a real conundrum here, by the way. And then football can fuck off and just come over here and do their own thing. It's crazy how much it's changed, man. Yeah. And it's all greed. It's all greed, but it's it's both sides. It's private equity firms trying to capitalize on the option for college football to be up for sale. But it's also the other side of these universities have been fighting revenue share for so goddamn long that it's gonna they're gonna bite their own. What is it? Save your save your nose to spite your face. Bite if your nose to spite your face. The face just got ate. You know they they just never gave the nose. They just let them eat their face. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
I think that worked. <laughs> I think, it did. I, I that think was you good. Got it. It's good now, boy. I like you it. Got it. Not bad. Eight out of ten. Um, by the way, if you're watching tonight, uh, almost 400 of you, we're going to roll over right after this, not live, but we're going to premiere a film study. It's 90 minutes long. It's primo shit. I ain't going to lie to you. It's good stuff. Um, the boys were in studio, so we got the camera switching. Okay. Uh, maybe there might be some construction done mid-show. Don't know. Might happen. That shit was so funny, dude. Stick around. Find out. You're definitely going to learn a lot of football. You might laugh as well. Uh, but that's coming up right at 9 o'clock. So make sure you won't, even, you won't even have to go nowhere. Okay, It's right here on the channel. Just just jump right over. But before we let Goaty go, um, by the way, again, thank you for coming all the way up here. Thank I know you, that. Man. I mean, it's about 90 minutes for Atlanta, isn't it? Yeah, that traffic was... Uh, it was hitting. My pa- uh, the Lord was testing my patience this afternoon. <laughs> you got peach pass? I do, but it was, it was still... It was still stacked. Yeah. That's on me, bro. Oh, um, yeah. oh, you know, much more convenient for, for, for the folks from Athens. First and last out. on air appearance. Yeah. First and last on air appearance. <laughs> it's been like that. Murray, Murray drove, I think that's Murray though. Murray drove over here, like 40 minute commute for him. And uh, ain't seen him since. <laughs> He'd been on the zoom. He'd been on the zoom. He walked in here. He's like, man, this is nice. Been on the zoom ever since. So that's hilarious. Uh, but before I let you, I, you have very, very distinct and obvious uh, experience with the transfer portal. So I want you to kind of walk us through the process. Okay. So yeah. you're at Georgia and you're like, all right, um, I, I'm, I want to play. I want to play. I want to go get some playing time somewhere. I'm going to enter the portal. How do you do that? I think it's first off important to talk about everybody has different reasons for getting into the portal. I think there's a big misconception out there that 100% of D1 football players are looking for a million dollars. Bag chaser. The 99% percenters of college football players are just looking for a chance to play. Mm. There's the one percenters that are looking for the money, but for the 99 percenters, it's it's just a play. So uh, for me, like my journey after my last season at Georgia, Coach Smart was unbelievable to me. It completely changed my life, um, gave me an opportunity but it was also very supportive of me making the decision that I made, uh, got in the portal. And what that looks like is uh, you go through your compliance office, mm-hmm. you meet with your head coach, they send you a couple modules that you have to do on informing you on what you're doing, all this kind of stuff. And then you click submit, they, the school puts your name in and that's really it for you. Mm. And then you would just wait. So for me, it was, I turned my phone on do not serve when I was officially in, when I got the text from compliance, and didn't look at my phone for like two hours and then picked up my phone, I had like 200 messages. Oh Lord. And so it can happen like that, or like my second time, it was a little slower mm. and happened a lot later on, um, but it's really Twitter heavy, very Twitter heavy mm. and very text heavy. Um, you know, it depends on the school, they're gonna communicate in different ways. Uh, but once you're in, you can talk to different schools. It's basically like recruiting all over again. Uh, during a certain time period, you can um, set up visits and stuff. One of the things too is people, you can you can get in the portal only for a certain amount of window, but you can also stay in the portal once it closes. So mm-hmm. you don't have to get in and get out. Yeah. Uh, you can stay in, it's not some magical portal, it's just a list of their name on it basically. Um, but while you're in it, you can communicate with coaches for a certain amount of time, go to a school, go to a visit, and boom, you're there. Hmm. There's way more kids that go into that thing that never find a home than I think people ever realize. It's tough, dude. I saw a stat, it might have been two years ago, where there was like 5,000 plus kids in the portal and there was only like 1,700 spots available on teams. I had a, I had a dad call me and I, at this point moving forward, I, I almost, I, I'm probably going to be very, very direct with them if I feel this way because this is what happened to the kid. He he, he told it, he calls like, I think we're going to hit the portal. And I was, I almost wanted to say, dad, I, I don't know if that's our, you know, I don't know if that's a good decision. I think you probably just need to hang out because what happens if no one calls? Because yeah. if no one calls, now you're no longer playing football. At least where you're at now, you're you're playing football. Like you're getting developed. Like you're having fun. You're developing relationships. Like you're extending your your academic career. Like you're playing football here. You might not be playing on Saturdays, but you're playing. I um, think that and that adds into the part of for me. Like I said, I was thankful for Coach Mar. I was thankful for uh, Coach Arnett, but super thankful for Coach Key and Coach Buster and Coach Brock because. You know, being in the portal a second time, being 23, being married, it's like, all right, am I on my way out? (laughs) What's going on here? And so for them to give me a chance as a 23-year-old to come in in my last year is, I mean, I'm just super thankful because there's a lot of kids that don't get that opportunity. I mean, shit, I'd take a third degree with Georgia Tech on it. Come on. (laughs) Come on, baby. Give it to me. 
my my question is and i don't know if you want to answer this or not but once a player decides you know i'm going to enter the portal but i'm still i'm I'm entertaining options is that where you're still with the team do most teams kind of say all right you're 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 dead to us or is it they're still acknowledging that you're part of the team and treating you the same way that's a great question i think there's two answers to that it depends on the school and the coach Mm -hmm. it also depends on how you go about it i think for there's a there's a big difference between guys that stay for four years graduate from that school or are there for two months and then leave. I think the coach will handle that differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but in most cases, it's it's more so of, it's, it's, a, it's a constant communication about how you're feeling about what you're doing. And then once you say, okay, I'm gonna do this, it's more like, okay, thank you. You know, gotcha. you can get on your way. Mm-hmm. Speaking of thank yous and you can get on your way, Rylan Godey. Hey, Rylan Godey, let's give him three. Bang, I ain't heard that in a while. That was, that was smooth. You, you had a coach give him three? Mm-hmm. Who? Uh, it was at it was at Georgia. Mm-hmm. A coach at Georgia gives mm-hmm. three. Yeah. Hey, my coach Kenny Dallas gives three. So I, I don't know about your coach, but my, the, my my give three coach is Kenny Dallas. What year did you go shorter? Uh, I was there thirteen to seventeen. Okay. Losing Damn. a bunch of games. Damn, you're old. Bunch of games. <laughs> yeah. You call them old? Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to the Grady boys over here. For real. Yeah. The youngsters. Yeah, you guys are finally educated in your journalism and shit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Goaty's got one. You can't disrespect us now. No, I, oh. he's got a bunch of them. What were your other degrees? Uh, got a stun on us, right quick. Sports media certificate from Georgia. Uh-huh. Shout out. Uh, one class away from a leadership master's at Mississippi State. Hell yeah. Ooh. Getting a couple of internships right now at Georgia Tech, and then starting a master's hopefully next spring. <sighs> no boy, educated. Three degree Goaty. That's what they're going to call him <laughs> now on. Academic weapon. Come on. <laughs> Academic weapon. Student, student, student athlete. Hey. <laughs> Three times over. He is Riley Goaty. We are the Film Guy Network. Hey, like I said, we have a whole other hour and a half of content coming up right now. Just hit the, uh, you know, whatever. Find it. It's over. It's coming up right now. I promise you. Love you. Bye.